All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Neff. I'm the National Sales Manager for Venus Optics here in the United States. Uh, here with the uh, Laua Meeting Masters series uh, with Felix Hernandez of uh, Dreamphography. Um, really interesting work, uh, toy and model photography, some, some really cool composites and work. So uh, I'm excited to uh, hear more about what he has to say and um, some of his techniques and tips that we can gain from him. Uh, so we're going to ask Felix, uh, we're going to say a quick hello and ask you to give us a, a quick um, introduction of yourself, where you're from uh, and, and how you got into photography, how you got started. Well, thanks for all. Thank you, Stephen, for having me and also to Laowa for this uh, chat. And of course, to all the people that are just now following this uh, conversation. So thank you so much. And um, I have been doing photography for, let's say, profession, professional photography for over 15 years, commercial photography. And uh, I'm a graphic designer. So I just started like doing graphic design, working for different like small local creative agencies. And things went uh, evolving. Uh, I ended up like launching my own creative firm. Uh, at that instance, I didn't do uh, photography. Like we hired other photographers when we need them. But uh, I mean, because we are living like in, a, I'm in Cancun, in Cancun, Mexico. It's like a really well-known place for, you know, the touristic, it's a touristic zone but it's not like a very big uh, creative hub. So when we had like some uh, commission at works that, that we needed uh, to, to maybe uh, use photography for, you know, an advertising or something, uh, I, I struggled a little bit because we didn't have like commercial photographers in Cancun or there were a few and bringing someone from outside, it was really expensive <laughs> because we were working for a small brand. So I decided that I will start doing like photography. This was now in the digital era. And of course, in the university, while, while I studied the graphic design career, I, I had some photography assignments. But back then in the era where everything was analog, you know, the dark room, uh, uh, medium and large format cameras in the studio and all that stuff. So in some way, I started doing photography uh, again, now professionally, without being a professional of photography, but in the digital era. So, I mean, it was the, the, the basic knowledge I had it, but it was just a thing of, you know, relearning uh, photography and studio photo photography in, in a digital era. So I have been doing that for almost 15, 17 years. And I mean, I have always uh, liked to experiment, uh, not only what the, the client's commission, no? uh, I think that the personal work is really, really important to, you know, uh, uh, communicate your own stuff, your own voice, your own vision. And uh, that's how I, let's say, found uh, uh, these toys or scale models and working them in a studio and making uh, uh, on camera effects and all this stuff and all, all, uh, mix it with what I already knew about digital manipulation, digital art. So, uh, but that's kind of recent, uh, I mean, so, six years. Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the fact that you say you, 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 you're studied as a graphic designer, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, just looking at your work and you talk about the, the visual, visualization of it. Um, yeah, seeing your work and seeing the stuff that you're putting together, it's definitely, personally, I am much more of a technical photographer um, and not the artistic. I don't have the eye and, and looking at your work and, and as I've been looking at the stuff you've done, uh, you, you're definitely coming at, coming at it from much more of an artistic lens. And so did I understand, so you went from the graphic design into more of the video side, you were making um, video productions and hiring out the photography and then adapted in your own, or was it sort of they both came together? Yeah, well, I started as a graphic designer, more like uh, doing branding stuff. 
but then I jumped in, in, in other small local agencies doing graphic design, but more for advertising. So there you start working with ideas in, and concepts, not only, let's say, the, the graphic part, but as well working in, with concepts and, and ideas. So I went more for the advertising side and then I jumped into photography. So some way it's like mixing uh, these three disciplines and then I added some more, the, the model scaling, the craft, you know, and also the digital, the digital art. I, I don't do a lot of videos. The, the, the videos you have seen mostly are for my personal projects, but now more often clients and uh, brands are asking for not just the still images, but also maybe an animated version and also the, the video of the BTS, how, how it was done. Well, and that certainly lends itself, right? The behind the scenes, to, as far as what you're doing, that very much lends itself to, um, to the video side of things, right? You're, you are doing um, the, the behind the scenes, the work that you're doing and the little bits and pieces, um, I, very, very impressive. So um, I, I wanna, on your website, I wanna touch really quick. Um, the, so this is your, um, your process page that, that you have, and it's very interesting for me to look through, um, where you're, you're talking about going through uh, setting up these composites. And so the model making side of things, my guess would have been that you had started from a model making standpoint um, and added the photography. So the, like, yeah, that's, I guess my, my photography background, uh, the model making is is the stuff that really impresses me and the, and the being able to think and see in that smaller scale um i i love it it's it's been really really cool to uh to look at your work and sort of see where you're starting with a base image and then building the different elements so you so one you're starting with the model model car there and then you're doing the model making to weather it and get some get some uh yeah make it look not like a toy but make it have some some realistic look to it um and then yeah again it was just like experimenting doing stuff in the studio and i mean i had not uh, a lot of time because i was working in in my creative agency and uh, I mean, I had to do something like, you know, to just to practice experiment that was really quick and, and handy and low budget. So, yeah, I, one day I just grabbed, uh, grabbed some toys of my kids and like started uh, experimenting with that. And for, I have always like loved uh, scale models and toys and, and telling stories and, and all the stuff. I knew how Star Wars was made, you know, it has always fascinated me, the, the original trilogy, a lot of the scenes we see uh, are done with scale models and, and in sets and doing practical effects. So I, I thought, well, it will be cool to try this. And, but I started just working, you know, you go to a store, you buy a model, a good model. And uh, I started taking the, 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 the photographs and making maybe making like a really simple landscape using just common things, uh, uh, flour or maybe pow some powders, stuff like that. Very, very simple. But uh, I mean, I really quickly like fall in love with this kind of, of photography and I decided to take it to the next step. And I have always loved to build stuff, you know, and so it was kind of natural for me. I'm far away from being, a, you know, a professional or a good uh, scale modeler or scale uh, terrain artist but i mean uh, uh, it's just about practice and everyday learning new techniques and now i mean i spend more time building these models and setups on landscape that making actually the the photo uh, uh, a production can take maybe one week or one month the pre-production of building these uh, uh, scenes and making the photos, it's maybe two or three days. Yes. Well, so if, if we go back and continue through, so all right, so you, you've got the, the model here of the car and you're do, setting the scene, and then it starts to become building the composite, right? Is 
Um, you've got the model, but then you're taking elements and combining them. And I love seeing all of the little pieces. I love, like, yeah, just where you're breaking down where everything comes from. Um, and actually, uh, so question about stock, stock images and where are you, like, in your composites, do you have it, like, are you using stock images? Um, and how often are you using stock versus going back into your own catalog of photography um, for backgrounds or for some of those smaller elements? Not like a simple, well, single, single path or there are no rules. I mean, sometimes it's a combination of what I shoot in the studio and uh, using uh, digital manipulation, using stock photography. Some other times is taking these dioramas, these little scenes into location, into location. So actually the background you're seeing is real. So it's also kind of a mix of landscape photography with the studio photography and all the stuff. Uh, uh, even I have used uh, 3D renders, just like a, let's say matte painting for the, for, for the background. Or sometimes I, I have a, a, an image, maybe a, a landscape a photo I took. Uh, I have my catalog and I just print it in like big, big canvas and I use them. I hang them in the studio and I use it as a background. So it depends what I'm trying to achieve. If I'm going to make video, I don't use a green screen. So it depends uh, on the assignment and also in my mood. <laughs> I'm always trying like different stuff. So yes, I, I use um, a stock image when I don't have what, what I need. Uh, but I also use a lot of uh, brushes, you know, uh, uh, I'm working in, in two softwares. Uh, uh, one is Affinity and the other one is Photoshop. They are kind of the same, but I do different stuff uh, in each one. And I do, I paint a lot, a lot with uh, digital brushes, the backgrounds, uh, clouds or trees or skies or whatever. And uh, all, other times I have a chance to travel. Uh, for example, there's a project I did with Audi. And uh, for one of the images, they didn't want to use stock photography. So I had to go to Dubai <laughs> just to make some landscape photography, but then adding it in, in post-production. So uh, yes, I mean, no rules, it, it depends. Awesome. Uh, it, all right, so if we, I'm gonna jump back out. We'll, we'll, I wanna come back to some of that production, but uh, backing up to equipment and gear and sort of where you started and how you've built and sort of the, the concept that you started with. So you started as a graphic design um, and then and then built more. What was your what was your first camera? It was a Canon Rebel XT or that's that's the name how we know it here in, in Mexico. I think it was one of the let's say first commercial digital cameras Canon DSLR. You know, yep. and I mean, I started with that because that was my budget, <laughs> and mm -hmm. also that was the the only model I, I found in, in in Cancun, and that's the reason I, I work with Canon. I keep working with Canon. I I feel familiar with that uh, brand, uh, you know. So, uh, but nowadays, mostly any camera brand uh, uh, can do the same thing. You have like different levels of of, of cameras. And uh, yeah, I'm working with 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 Canon. So so then the question is, what are you working with now? What's what's your primary camera at this point? Right now, I'm still working with a DSLR. It's a it's a Canon 5D Mark IV. And uh, yep. since I think the next model is not going to go out, I'm jumping now to the mirrorless. Okay, it could be the yep. I think the Canon R5 that for the kind of work that I do, it's perfect. So that thing of overheating and all the stuff, it doesn't matter to me because if I made videos, just maybe five uh, seconds, you know, and I stop and rearrange everything and go again. So yes, I think I'm going to get this year the R5 or I don't know, but. Yeah, I, so certainly going from the 5D Mark IV, the, the R5 is, is the next step. But yeah, and for video, if you're just doing short clips and, or even medium clips. I don't think it's much of an issue, but 
again, Cancun, you say, uh, can certainly get pretty warm, so that may <laughs> may be an issue. But I don't I, I don't think you'd have much issue. It, yeah, I've, I've played with the R5 and R6 quite a bit, and they're but, pretty sweet. Most of the time, I'm indoors. You know, I'm 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 in the studio. Let's say ninety five percent. I'm in the studio, and when I'm making landscape photography, usually is not in it's not in Cancun. Maybe. Um, um, Denmark, Iceland, China, well, Dubai is hot, so that would have been a problem with the R5, but I mean, they are just like, when making video, just small, small clips. Um, so, some of the elements that you're using, um, or, or equipment, I'm, like, so the, what's foreign to me is the model making side of things, and, and I'm curious, are there any, like, model making tools that you find particularly helpful in on the photography side of things are there any like clips or clamps or are there any things that like aren't traditionally a photographer or a photographic or a video tool that you you found particularly useful on the photography side on on the photography side for the kind of photography that i do it's it's let's say it's kind of new thing now but of course just remember back in the days when where when we didn't have the cgi all was done in, in camera and a lot of commercial and movies again were done building these uh, miniature, miniature setups uh, uh, but the tools i mean in it depends on on your scene and how wide or how close you you want your scene and it also depends in the size of the model that's that's really important the the thing is that the bigger the model the more realistic is going to is going to look and that's because the depth of field. You know that if you get really, really close to a small object, you will lose depth of field. And how our brain is trained to perceive scale is that if you see all in focus, let's say that means that that is like a real scene. But if you start losing really quickly that depth of field, our brain tells us that that's a small object. So uh, it, it's, it's really important the size of the scene, the size of the model, and depending on that is the lens you are going to to choose and also the the side camera because uh uh let's say greater depth of field you are going to achieve so in fact if if, if i took all my my images with um just the the, the camera lens of the smartphone you will have greater depth of field than using like a medium format camera so a lot of people ask, hey, what's, what's the camera you are using? I mean, for this kind of photography, you can use any kind of camera. Uh, and uh, if, even the, the crop sensor cameras or even a smartphone can do the job. Of course, yeah, for commercial you know, uh, uh, assignments, you cannot shoot with this one because you don't have like the same flexibility and resolution that a professional camera will give you. The, I'm going to keep going on the equipment side um, while I'm trying to adjust here. Um, for uh, for video and and uh, motion control, so you, you you've been doing. Yeah, I mean for video, I want to maybe. Uh, make some shots uh, that are not so static so i want to add a uh, movement but i i bought the um uh, as, as a motorized slider because i was using in fact one of your lenses that's the laowa pro lens i have it here maybe not everyone knows about this lens but it's like a really funny looking lens and this is a great lens because it allows you to go deep into like, you know, small places and get really, really uh, uh, close to them. And also it's a wide angle lens. So you have a lot of uh, angle no, of view and it also gives you great depth of field. It starts in 14 and goes to 40. That's that's crazy. You need tons of light. But I mean, it's a it's a like a really, really unique lens. But the thing is that because it's a macro, kind of uh, heavy, 
uh, if you want to achieve some movement like um, by hand in a slider, it will shake. And just the minimum like shake, it will notice in your, your video. So for this one, I bought um, a, a, a slider uh, that I can control with, a, with an app. into the probe because uh, yeah the, the the 24 millimeter probe lens it's a lens that loves movement right it's so for video work the that perspective that that parallax it loves when you sort of like when you're able to shift and move along things at scale so yeah having some motion control and have having the slider definitely changes what that lens can do and there's certainly photo for for photo, there are plenty of things that that lens can do that there's just nothing else out there that can do it. And I, I'm, whenever I'm talking about the probe lens, I, I will, I'm always adamant to say it is not an easy lens to use. It is not forgiving, but when you're, when you do get something that hits, it, it there's. I mean, I'm still learning. Every time I use it, I, I learn like different things or try different things because, as you said, it's not an easy lens to use, but it's also very creative when you kind of manage or understand how it works. I got the, this is it, this was the cine version, so this is meant to be more for video. It don't have f stops; it has t stops, uh, and I know there's a like a photography lens with f-stops, right? Uh, another version of this one. But I just got it yeah, thinking uh, more in, in video to really, really get close and do these uh, movements. So I got this one. And um, I mean, it's it's pretty pretty fun to work with it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a unique point of view that no other lens can can give you. Also, the uh, you've recently started, and we, we talked a little before, but you've recent start, recently started using the Lao 100 millimeter, uh, 100 millimeter macro. It's 2x factor of magnification. I love this lens. I have it just, uh, let's say, recently. <laughs> I think uh, for over maybe six, seven months. I haven't had the chance to work a lot with uh, making photography with that lens because um, most of the scenes I'm doing right now um, it's uh, are more for in the wide angle uh, aspect radio, so I'm using wide angle lenses, but I'm using a lot of this lens again for video, so for string close-ups or close-ups, and it's really, really sharp. and. Uh, and yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm loving using it, but most for for video. And just to say, the, the Laowa Cine version lens, the 24 Pro lens, uh, I have used it as well for photography. It's not my main use, but I have done some pretty cool <laughs> photos with it. And uh, it also works great. You are using at this point um, for, for most of your work. You, you said it was the um, the Canon 24 millimeter tilt shift. And I had to do a lot of research to find um, just the right lens for the kind of photography I wanted to do, because there's not like a dedicated uh, you know lens for you know making this kind of, uh, of photography. So. I, I was looking for a lens that allowed me to get close to the scenes, 
relatively close. Um, in centimeters could be between 30 to 20 centimeters close to the scene. But as well, it has to be a wide angle lens to have some of the models all in frame because again these models sometimes are not so small i have like a i normally work if i'm using cars they are 118 of a scale so they are not so small i have one here just to you can have a, a sense of the, the size of the, of the 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 models so it had to be uh, that you can get close to the scene that um, wide angle enough to have it all in the frame, and also the the shift and tilt factor. You know, uh, when you place, get close to something with a an wide angle lens, it tends to uh, deform. So you you can correct here that distortion, and as well with the tilt, you can achieve even greater depth of field. So uh, even sometimes shooting at f18 or f22 or whatever. You, because you are so close to the subject, you don't have that great depth of field to sell the, the idea that it's a real size uh, model. So that lens like gather all the stuff that I was looking for, for making this kind of photography. So it depends again, uh, because some of the shots I have done it with the 100 millimeter, but mostly I'm using wide angle lens, the 24 uh, uh, tilt and shift. That's right. So yeah, so again, I'm 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 setting myself up here, um, and, and the next lens that I'm I'm gonna see if we can get uh, get a sample out to you because I want to see what you can do with it. Is one of our newer lenses is the uh, the Lawa 15 millimeter shift lens, um, and so it still ha you, so it's going even wider, full frame coverage on your your uh, your 5D Mark III, or excuse me, 5D Mark IV. Um, but you have the ability to um, to shift, so it's a, a the widest angle shift lens available. And so, looking at your work and looking at what you've done, I'm really curious to see what you could do with something like this. Um, and also, even I, I've I've done some some playing around with um, shifting with video. Um, and so, what the the Lawa, the me, the me mechanism that it has to allow you to shift allows you to um, shift very smoothly with the the, sh the ring on the lens right so you can see as I as I twist I can get my shift and then I can also twist the the mount as well so that I can get a vertical shift a horizontal shift or an angular shift um, in any position so I Borrow me that, that lens, that will be great, because sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm working with the 24, but for some scenes I need a little more of that wide angle, and uh, I, I think having a 15, it's 15, right? 15 millimeters? That could come very, very handy. And I also love to do, uh, I mean, um, landscape photography, again, from my background, so having those kinds of lenses are very, very Handy. I have a trip in November in, to Iceland, so maybe I can. <laughs> with uh, with something like that lens. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back a little bit and talk about depth of field. Do you do any focus stacking in your work? And sometimes even uh, uh, working at the highest f-stop, f20, f22, and uh, even doing uh, the tilt function in the lens, you don't get the depth of field, the enough depth of field. And again, that depends on the size of the model and the size of the scene. So, yeah, sometimes I do focus stacking. Not so much, because when you do focus stacking, uh, all the images have to be, you know, the same. You cannot move anything. So for most of my images, I do on-camera effects, adding smoke or fog or fire or whatever, and that changes. I, I, I cannot have that, 
that effect in all of the in, 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 yes in all of, in all of the images for the focus stacking. So I use it, but not very often. In fact, in one of the shots, it's a coke cap and a cigarette butt that, that I sent you that I took with the probe lens. Uh, I was like at F18, but I also did focus stacking for those images to achieve greater depth of field. Shot with the, the probe, I think, right? That was the, with the 24 mm probe? Yeah. Yep, I remember seeing that, the, that image. Yes, again, I normally just use a regular lens. It could be between 24 to 100 millimeters. So I don't get so close. Uh, I, don't, I normally don't use macro. If I use a macro like the 100 or the 24 millimeters is in the special uh, you know, uh, assignments that I have or personal projects, but most of the time it's just done with a regular lens. They are, the, the models, the scenes are not so, are not so small. And, um, and yeah, but I mean, it depends. I Last year I started a series like working with really, really small models. They are like train HO scale. It's, it's called, uh, kind of a conceptual thing, a little bit different from what I normally do. And for that, I used a macro lens, the 100 millimeters, as well uh, the 24 low, uh, but they are so small that I also wanted some compression. So for that, uh, the 100 millimeters macro from La Agua, it's it's great. I'm going to keep touching on equipment for a little bit, but we are going to get to the art because that's definitely uh, clearly a, a big side of your work. Um, smoke, you smoke and fire. What's what's your go to? Uh, go to smoke uh, tool. Hey there. Okay. That. Yeah, I. I have to be honest. I smoke, and I started like some of my first project. I needed smoke, and you know, I I had it here. Uh, but when you are doing a scene and you have to smoke like three cigarettes in a row, I mean, that's not good. <laughs> it's worse <laughs> and uh, um, it's not practical, okay? So then I started uh, experimenting with uh, vapes, but it was kind of the, the same thing. And I, I found like a little, little machine that it's called the micro fogger. It looks like a vape, but it's uh, designed for production, photo and video production, and it's really, really small. And it works with glycerin, so no, no, no problem there. And uh, I work with that when I have to do like small scenes with, with smoke. When I have to do larger thing, uh, scenes, I normally use um, a smoke machine, but it has to be a low fog machine, so that uh, fog has to chill down to cool down so it stays in the in the ground depends what what kind of effect you want to do if i want to do some clouds then i use the just a regular fog machine and i also work a lot with dry ice just you know it's, uh, just dry ice and uh, that gives you a lot of uh, really really dense uh, fog smoke and it also stays stays low uh, mm -hmm. The atmosphere, the atmosphere uh, I have never tried that because uh, getting it in, in, in Cancun is really, really hard. And I cannot even order it because, because it's in a compressed bottle, so they will not send it to, to Cancun. So I have not worked with that one. Microfogger. 
uh, I, I don't have like the, but if you search like micro fogger, I think the brand is Consig, something Consig. I don't know, micro fogger, there's, there's just like one. Yeah. Uh, lighting lightning round. Um, so I'm, I'm, lighting clearly is a big part or a big component of your work. And so I, all different kinds of lights. So I've got a, a couple questions that I'm, I'm want, sort of a quick answer on. Uh, so we're going to start with what's your favorite strobe light? Uh, are you talking about a brand? I mean, I use this. I'm using Bowens that I think no longer exist, and also Einstein lights when I have to freeze action. Okay, and now that's the thing that I have like recently, last two years, to start using more constant light than flashes, and I'm working with Godox. I have like really different kind of lights from Godox. And, uh, and I mean, it has been great because again, for most of my scenes, there's nothing moving. So working with constant light gives me the, you know, I can see just live <laughs> how, the, how the light is affecting the, the, the scene. So I think it's a great advantage. Everything is LED, and because as well for video, and these are LEDs done for for video and, and, and photography, because you don't have a flickering. If you and and I'm sometimes like shooting at 16 or 20, uh, 120 frames per second, so using other kind of uh, constant light will give you like that uh, flickering or vibration in the in the image. Well, the, 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 my favorite is the it's umbrella. I think it's seven foot. Uh, 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 how, how do you say it's seven seven foot? Uh, uh, the size to size when the the umbrella is open, and it has also like a diffuser. So it's kind of a umbrella soft box and gives you a really really like a soft light. So I use it that mostly when I want to represent like a um, cloudy day, overcast sky, because it gives you that really, really soft uh, light. But I use all kind of uh, modifiers uh, uh, from beauty dishes, soft boxes, umbrellas, um, harsh light, just working with, um, I have like uh, really, let's say special lights that are called focusing light. So the, the light has a lens and you can project like tiny figures or just put the light in a in a in a very small spot because it works focusing the the light and i also work with rgb like uh, uh lights just to maybe if i want to make a sky blue sky i just put these rgbs back in the scene and i can turn uh, i have a big wall white wall, I turn it all blue, any kind of blue, or maybe it's a sunset, then I turn it to an orangey tone, and uh, yeah, a lot of flexibility using LED, uh, LED lights and modifiers. <laughs> and so, yeah, so uh, like, so big, li big light modifiers and small light modifiers. Um, and then, so the last question I'm going to say is, uh, What's the if you had one like a number one lighting rule that you follow or a lighting tip that you could share with us? What would that be? Well, I I try that it looks for most of the scenes. I try that it looks that it's all only one uh, source light because most of this most of the scenes I'm trying to represent are outdoors. So of course outdoors you have just let's say a main lighting source that will be the sun or the moon 
and of course maybe you have some artificial light coming so from you know maybe some uh, um, street uh, lights or something like that or the head uh, the headlights of a car or something like that but i i try to keep it simple but keeping it simple is not so simple <laughs> in the studio so i don't know if that's a tip <laughs> the tip will do will be like just try to experiment i mean some of the shots i just use let's say two two lights one for the for the scene and the other one for the background if i'm adding like a digital background i have to kind of evenly lit the the, the background so two lights is more than enough but others get really really complex and i cannot show you but i have a scene here that i have like oh my one two three four five six seven eight lights <laughs> So, in specific positions. So, yeah. So the um, and what I heard is that they like, especially with the composite work, trying to keep consistent light sources, right? Knowing and that's going to be tough. Knowing ahead of time where the elements are going to go, and that's going to lead me in nicely into the the next sort of con concept I want to talk about, um, which is sort of the pre visualization. So, um, yeah, as you're lighting you're so you say you're, tr you're trying to stay consistent with what it's going to look like so how how detailed do you get into a like a pre-visualization of a composite work or do you have a sketch in your head do you like do you draw it out do you know all the different elements so that as you're photographing the elements that you need you know where the lights like so yeah we say that all right if there's a street light and there's a bunch of different elements you're lighting each element with the same concept of where it's going to go is that that's sort of how you're working yeah i mean i normally don't do sketches uh, certainly not for the, the personal projects i as you said I, I have like the sketch and and the idea in my mind and that's my my guide for commercial project in most of the cases they ask me for for a sketch but i mean it's it's mostly like a rough sketch i'm not showing them the the mood or the color or the where are the lights going so for commercial projects and even for personal projects, I have the idea in mind or sketch it. I go into the studio, I build all the setup, I do the lighting. I take like one or two days just doing the lighting setup and I shoot and I go into the computer and I see if it works. OK, and if not, I, I normally go back and change the things a little bit. So I find myself like doing one, let's say one image two or three times. You know, because it's, it's part of um, seeing what is going to work for 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 that scene and for those images for the final composites. Uh, most of the images I do are not done, let's say, in one shot. OK, uh, you do it like in different passes, uh, like they they do it in the uh, for a for a, mov a movie. And that's because the lighting you have like a general lighting that shows a little bit of everything but then you have like a very specific lights like let's say the light that comes uh, inside a house well you expose just for that light and all those different passes then are put together in in post production so yeah all right so so lighting and previsualize so the now you've got me thinking about a bunch of different things as far as how large a scale do you see yourself working? Are you like are you focused on staying small, or, or um, could you see yourself going to a larger, larger scale with the same concept of composites and, and building, building a scene, um, but going to a photographing and shooting at a life size scale? Is that is that a direction you see yourself uh, going to, or experimenting with maybe some personal projects or? So oh, I mean, I I started like doing real life size uh, uh, photography of whatever models, landscape products, cars, and all this stuff. And uh, I mean, I like it, but what I, I found, I, I was lucky enough to find my niche, and uh, uh, that clients look for this kind of photography that I really really enjoy. Um, I mostly work alone. I, I, I don't want to scale, you know, in 
people or again i had a creative agency and i went away from that world just to, <laughs> to be like a lone wolf uh, uh i mean it's part of my personality i have worked for commercial products with uh, other creatives when needed but uh yeah and the the size of the scale scenes could be anything could be really something really small sometimes they are as big as this room or if it comes a project where i have to rent like a bigger space to to make a larger scene that's okay with me um while it's a you know a, a scale scene i'm okay with that question from i've got a question from the chat here um I, so this is from scott zempel uh, your work is amazing at storytelling. Can you tell us about your process of the telling a story through a single image? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, let's say, sources of inspiration. But yes, I can go back even to my childhood because I was kind of a, you know, a geek or nerd kid that was always in his room playing with his toys. And I was like, by playing, uh, um, creating my own worlds or, or stories. So I have always loved that. And uh, then the background that I have as a graphic designer and then working in the advertising industry, creating concepts and stories for different brands. And of course, uh, you start thinking in your own. And uh, I find a lot, a lot of inspiration as well in my dreams. Uh, uh, that's why this I have this strange name called dreamography that basically uh, states that uh, I'm portraying portraying what I see in my in my dream so um, I use the dreams as a source of inspiration that doesn't mean that what I dream I I, I do it it's just uh, in the dreams you they you have this kind of dreamy dreamy images that are really really personal and uh i take some of those images that i see in the dreams to as a, as a base to create uh, my images and and also for commercial work i kind of i kind of uh kind of uh how do you say to before i go to sleep to program my brain uh, if i want to dream in some theme specifically okay that's a, like a little bit of training but Let's say I want to make a image of uh, war and peace. So of course I do a lot of research. I, I see movies or read a book or music that has to be with that theme. So I saturate my brain. And when I go to sleep, those images come uh, uh, to life. It's just like if you are seeing Netflix and you are just going to see one chapter and you end up seeing all the season in one night. When you go to sleep, you are going to dream about w what you saw <laughs> in that TV show. So it's kind of the little, um, a same, uh, let's say, formula to come up with these uh, images in the dreams. I, yeah, I, I love that concept of, of sort of priming yourself and, and thinking, but like actually, like, of course we do it. And I'm, I'm thinking, you've, you've got me thinking about, uh, when, when I get far too into a video game, it hasn't happened in a few years, but I, I will start dreaming in the video game. And so, but like thinking about it much more of an intentional practice, that's a really interesting concept of like trying to feed yourself all like all, from all different areas just so that it, it builds, but actually having that be part of the practice. Um, the amazing thing is that, that you absorb all this inspiration and you take it into the dreams, but they, they, they come out of that, it also has a lot of you, you know, because the dreams are in the subconscious. So there are your, you know, your fears, your everything, it mix it up. It's like a blender and they come out, it's like really, really personal. So I think like as, let's say as an artist, it's really important to put uh, something or a lot of yourself in the, the art you are creating. So dreams are really, really great to pull that out. Awesome. That, and that's, uh, you, you went right into, because one of the questions that I, I had is around dreamography. 
um, and, and where it came from. So you, you, you beat me to uh, asking the question even. Um, another question we got here, um, if you could photograph one type of subject for the rest of your career, what would it be? Oh my, that's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I could do that because I'm always trying to change. I mean, I have done a lot of uh, miniature car photography, but that was something because, you know, brands started like <laughs> looking for that. So I went that way. But uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm not really a car, a guy car or car guy. Uh, I like cars, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan. I use, I do it mostly for, you know, commercial purpose and also personal, personal projects. But I, re I really don't have like a, a theme. I also do a lot of uh, shots of, um, you know, with Star Wars models and figures and spaceships and all this stuff because I love Star Wars. Uh, but I don't see myself just doing that. Uh, uh, I get bored pretty, pretty <laughs> fast. So I have to keep changing. So I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I will get bored really quickly. That's great. <laughs> Do I discount as well? I think yes. <laughs> so next question I've got, um, what is your, yeah, so, so I'm gonna start with what is your favorite part of, your produ of the production and, and the way that you work? What's your favorite thing about it? And then we're, of course, we're going to have to go on the, on the back end and see what, what's your least favorite part. But I, I'm, I'm interested, like, what's, what's your favorite part of how you work and the way, the way your production goes? Oh, well, it, it's a mix. Also, that one is a tough one question. Uh, let's say it's a mix, uh, first of creating a concept, an idea that could be like one day or one month. You never know, but that's the first step. The second thing will be the craft. It's creating these scenes, gathering models, buying or building from scratch or 3D printing or whatever. The next one will be setting up, you know, those models in the studio, the lighting, uh, design, uh, choosing the right lens, the right angle, the distance, all the stuff. And the last part will be the post-production, taking all that to uh, the, the, the software and giving shape to all the to to all the, the elements so i think right now the the part that i most enjoy is the craft okay it uh, working with your hands creating something from you know maybe paper or cardboard or whatever material you are using is i find it like fascinating being able to hold it, you know, uh, I, I think that's a, a painting, you know, uh, uh, giving the rusty effect. Uh, uh, all, I, I really enjoy the, the craft part and it's where I spend more time, okay? But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy the, the, the other steps of my, of my process, but I think that's the, my favorite one right now. So, so then what is the least favorite part? Um... If, if if there is something that that you'd had to say, uh, I think could be setting. I don't know. I, I I like everything, but I think setting the light, and and I think it's it's not that I don't like it, the lighting design, but I think I stroll a lot, or you know, I set the lights in one way and I like it, but I change something. I like like it even more. So uh, it's kind of, you know, for me, difficult to decide how I'm going to light the scene. Uh, uh, it gives me a little bit more of, of a conflict, internal conflict. But I mean, I enjoy it as well. It's part of the process. 
so the, we've got another question in the chat from uh, Luke Giot, uh about specifically about the, your your work with the twenty four millimeter probe lens. Um, do you use the built in light at all um, onto the front element of that probe? Honestly, uh, I think that light is really really handy if you are like going into a, a, a small place and you are not able to put like an external light. And I think it will be handy for that. Uh, uh, and it's a great feature, but I mean, it's a small light, it's a harsh light, it goes like, it's, it's in front of the element. So uh, normally you try to light up to get a little bit of uh, volume. So you try to put the lights in the side or, or in the back uh, to give a, a sense of also depth and all this stuff. So I haven't used it, but I mean, it's there and maybe one day I, <laughs> I will do it. Yeah, the, the, uh, certainly if you were getting closer, the, the, the light on the probe, right? If you were, if you were doing that, that ultra macro side, going into that one-to-one -one and beyond, yeah, that's, that's where the, the built-in ring light makes a lot of sense. But for what you're doing where you, you're looking for the lighting design, and as you just said, like you're, you're spending days um, tweaking the light and, and getting it just right to, to create what you're, the, the effect you're looking for. So for that type of work, I don't think it makes sense for you to use the the light, the built-in light on the probe. Um, it in the studio, but I'm pretty sure if I was in like in the field, you know, uh, and, and I have to go really close to some subject or going inside a small hole, something like that. Yeah, it's good to know it's there. My last question um, that I've got before we go is. Um, are there any photographers that inspire you? Uh, and and that, I say photographers, but certainly model makers and um, other designers in, in the work that you do. Uh, are there any pe people specifically that you can point to as your inspirations? Yes, I, I mean, there are so, so many. Um, um, in, in, in each of the fields, in, in the model making, crafts, in photographers, and um, in, most of them, uh, they they don't even do the kind of photography that I do. I mean, it's uh, for example, there's a really well-known photographer called Bong Wong. You know, I like his kind of work. I, I like his uh, proposal. He's all into environment. I like the images he created using just plastic bottles and garbage and all this stuff. There's another good friend called uh, Adrian Sommelin. He's a great photographer, but also a great uh, digital artist doing uh, really, really cool stuff. And I love his work. And uh, um, Eric Johansson, that's another really well-known photographer for his uh, photography and uh, manipulation digital art skills. So there are plenty. And, uh, but I follow as well a lot of, um, DG, um, let's say, conceptual illustrators. Okay, concept illustrators. They mostly work for the uh, movie industry, gaming industry. And what I love about them is the scenes they can create, they can envision, and they have no limits. You know, whatever they imagine, they can draw it. And, and this huge landscape with mountains and all this stuff. Uh, and, and, and there I follow some of them. I not know a lot of them. So uh, uh, yes, there's inspiration everywhere. I follow a lot of artists, different kind of artists. Awesome. That, so, yeah, we've got. I'm gonna check and see if we've got any more questions. Um, I think I think that's it. And uh, Felix, I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, the conversation. Uh, you've definitely got uh, me inspired to. I've got a four and a half year old daughter who's got a bunch of fun toys. So you've got me inspired to uh, pull out uh, some of those toys and and see what sort of uh, images I can make. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, our Meet the Master series, Meeting the Master series um, here with Venus Optics and Lawa Lenses. So it's a real pleasure to, to speak. No, thank you guys for having me. I really enjoy it. Hopefully some of the things that, <laughs> what, what I said uh, makes sense <laughs> because my my English, but I have really enjoyed this, this talk and uh, thank you.
Uh, it's it's been great. Have a great one. For all all the people that are watching. See you.